Hey everybody, BTO Pro here. Welcome to IST402. Well, today we're going to be talking about HTML and CSS. I'd like to thank our sponsors today, Gummy Bears. Gummy Bears and a lot of coffee. We need a lot of coffee if we're going to ever produce anything of value, as we know, in our developer world. So make sure you stock up on coffee at... That's the part where it would fill in the thing. And then get your gummy bears from... Let's start the show. I mean, class. It's class. That's right. It's not a show. It's not me. So, talking about HTML and cascading style sheets. Definitely not hand placement. It, that's what it stands for. Cascading style sheets. CSS. I know. Maybe you say, hey, I'm from Philadelphia. I'm sorry for you. However, this is not standing for cascading style Wawa's. That would be a much better acronym. And then sheets, to be perfectly honest, because they do make better sandwiches. Anyway, this is more commonly known as HTML and CSS, right? Hypertext markup language is what HTML stands for. And it looks something like what we have over here, right? So this is HTML, brackety, ugh, backslashes, lots of syntax, equal signs. Ugh, we're going to unpack that. And CSS, or cascading style sheets. HTML providing our structure, CSS providing our design layer. So our topics for today, we're going to go into some history of the web and industry shift. What a simple web transaction looks like uh, as far as what the front end, back end of an application are commonly known as in a web server transaction. HTML, hypertext markup language, and DOM, uh, which is short for document object model. It's something we're going to unpack as well. See a lot of examples. Also, get into some CSS examples and resources. And we're going to have one of those moments that we have, which you'll find out about later. It's called Valley Gone Valley. And establishing our lab context. So, potential resume bullet points for today. You want to get out your resume, your sheet of paper, for today. We're going to be talking about HTML, CSS, BEM, I'll even throw out there, Tailwind CSS, Bootstrap CSS, always known as kind of like CSS uh, frameworks. So the thing is, with this and all other topics, here we go. I am unpacking the words and the giving you the ability to learn about this space more effectively. If you get into an interview or you hand in a resume and you have not a word of Bootstrap CSS, yet the person you are applying for a job with says, recommended experience with Bootstrap, you immediately fall lower in the stack. However, if you have that word, and then can have an intelligent conversation about it because you engaged in the lab in lecture, on the blank, whatever the sponsorship is, then you get higher in the stack. Magic, I know. So places to Google more about topics related to what we're talking about. W3C, what I, uh, accessibility, alley on the web, can I use.com, great space to go to figure out what you can use uh, when doing web development in general. Codepen.io and glitch.me are great places to mess around with uh, little code examples, uh, pick them apart. That's how I learn best. That's how I started out learning. Web development is just reverse engineering, pulling in threads of things. Really good for that. Uh, also, CSS Tricks is a great space for reading up more on CSS, and they get into JavaScript as well. It's kind of a poorly named site, in my opinion. But uh, And then lastly, W3 Schools. Some people knock W3 Schools for certain topics. I think it's perfectly fine for you know getting a, a hello world understanding of things. So some terms and definitions, if you've never seen them, HTML, CSS mentioned. JS is commonly uh, abbreviated. It's JavaScript, not to be confused with Java, which is, it's not Java spacebar script, it's Java script, one word. Uh, DOM is a document object model. W3C is World Wide Web Consortium. It's why all of this exists. It's what I'm speaking to you from now, delivered through a web interface, most likely on the YouTube webs. What a woog is the Web Hypertext Application Technology Working Group, otherwise known as, wow, how many more words can we throw into this acronym? Um, and HTTP, Hypertext Transfer Protocol, if you've never heard of it. So, um, HTTP is Hypertext Transfer Protocol, 
you might ask yourself, if you've clicked the little lock icon, they hide this entirely now in most browsers, but if you click the lock icon and exp or click and expand what the address actually is, it does start with something before that web portion. And you're hopefully seeing this on an HTTPS. So what does the S stand for, class? Anybody? Oh, it's just, it's just me alone in my base. My mistake. Sorry. There's no audience here for this version. So it's secure, which of course implies that the original one is not, and thus having to make a secure version of it. We are talking about ancient APIs from the perspective of people using the web and the internets. So by definition, HTTP is not secure. Just a fun fact. So now on to HTML, building blocks of the web, or as old time strong dad would say, I have a lot of strong dad references. I mean, come on, the guy's amazing. Building blocks of the web. There we go. Correct voice usage. So as we all know, well, no, we, you're learning. As you will learn, every developer in humanity at any point in time toggles between these states. They take the code and they meticulously edit line 65. Yes, I am going to add a for each loop here. They put it in place. They use some syntactical sugar. And my God, what an amazing for loop that is. I truly am a space god. I'd say Roman god. That makes more sense in this context. But the picture is of like a spaceship. Man. So I am building the future. And then when you hit save and everything breaks, you are the dog at the keyboard who has literally no idea what's going on and has spent the last two hours debugging that you didn't have a curly brace on line 62, the line just off the viewport of what you're working on currently. So uh, obviously Watch Dogs is another one, right? I love playing the game Watch Dogs. I'm like, oh my gosh, I am a hacker because I pushed the A button, even though that's not what hacking is. So we are all learning on this journey of life to become web developers, not like Aiden Pierce. I mean, I don't want to know what type of code that guy writes. He's just mashing the A, B, X button and magically like sewer grates are blowing up. But this is phase one, okay? This is a three-part journey with this course. Phase one is all fundamentals of the web, right? And so we've got 90s memes for 90s technology because that's largely when it was propagated. Um, so HTML minus CSS, you can think of as 90s internet, my internet, the right internet, the best internet, the fast internet, other than the, the connection speeds were hell. So looking at this example is from Code Academy. It really, I, I like it illustrates this, right? We've got these three tabs. The first one is telling you about CSS. The next one is saying, hey, here's an HTML document without CSS enabled. And then over here, here's what it renders as. So they've got the CSS split out from the HTML. HTML forms the structure of the document. But if you don't render any of the CSS with the styling, you get something like this. It's just a pure top to bottom. Here's what I have. There's some minor formatting in things like bulleted lists. This is a heading, and though it, it's default is that it's presented larger. That's not the real reason it's that way. Uh, there's also links, right, and some very minimalist styles. Turn off CSS, you've got the 90s effectively because of the way that everyone's set in motion default state of HTML pages. They more or less have to keep that default state and then build on top of it for all of time. But add in CSS and we're in living color. Fantastic. I add the reference into that style.css file and suddenly this looks gorgeous. It could potentially be inaccessible, but it's gorgeous. Let's ignore that. So the ELI5 version of a web server, right? Because before we do HTML, we need to know why HTML. Web applications in their most basic form, there's something storing something, a database, right? If you had a folder on your desk somewhere, that's storing stuff, lowest level, right? We've got to put stuff someplace. Application logic to make sense of it, right? So load the stuff up from there, do something to interpret how it should be handled. And then lastly, what you see on your device, right? I've got my phone and I see something that came from a server that was loading stored hard data, if you will. 
And now for something completely different. Tomorrow, I thought that's it. Yeah, no, somebody's name really updates there. So what's a database? Well, you should have taken IST 210, preferably with me. And now if you're not part of the university audience, you go, I don't know what that is. But it's a database course that I, I wrote that is also in a very similar style. Some of those lectures are also online. You can check them out. So web apps boiled down. Uh, we've got a front end of an application. This is things commonly referred to as HTML, JavaScript, CSS, maybe the application phone user interface or like an app on your computer. Uh, what the user experiences engages with, right? It's what they use, the front, like front facing, front of the house, front door, whatever analogy you want to use. Then there's the back end or where it comes from. So this is things like languages like PHP, Python, Go, Ruby, Node, scripting languages that run on a server. So this is advanced logic of server interfacing with you so that whenever that address call goes out, says, hey, load XYZ website, server handles request, runs these languages, presents a message, sends it back to your screen, it looks a certain way. So trolling another course in the curriculum, this <laughs> there's a whole course about just the transport layer. Um, so in 219 less slides, Right, we've got the web is effectively a server or something interacting over the HTTP protocol, hopefully HTTPS so it's secure, and then sending it to me on my device, phone, computer, whatever. Uh, this is from the Mozilla developer documentation, really great resource, highly recommend going there. You'll notice I pull a lot of stuff from there. So what this image actually is, it's made up of lots of different pieces, right? So that front end device, of the computer, that's your HTML with, for structure, some styling, some web interfacing with the device itself, and some interactivity, like when I tap things, stuff opens, modals expand, collapse areas, things like that. It gets to me via transport layer, but there's a lot going on in the server as well. That's why there's a whole course just dedicated to that. So today we're focusing up here in the web. So visualized another way, right? I'm loading something on my phone. Let's say there's an image, there's some text, there's the styling, there's a video, and there's an advertisement. These all magically arrive there via the internet, right? So maybe that ad is loading from some ad server, but it was placed there by the web server. So I'm requesting a website, which is made up of different resources, things like page.html, a video file, an image, CSS for styling, and then this server sends me back the way this should all be put together, and my device stitches things together by making these other connections. So, or as, as we know, really exists on any modern website, every single one of these requests is an advertisement. In fact, if you get a, a browser plugin, I believe it's called disconnect.me, you can sit there, just sit there and tick up all the ads and all the tracking data that you're leeching everywhere. Anyway, a poorly drawn basic application that has really cool glasses. There's nothing to it other than that. I just try to keep re-emphasizing these ideas. So uh, a poorly drawn basic app, right? This is our front end. The user uses a website, a phone application on the front end to connect to the back end, which is presumably some server connecting to a data store. Here it says things like PHP and MySQL, but you can swap those out for all kinds of other logos and labels. So for our super simple example today, we've got PHP as a server language and MySQL is our database storage engine. So I'm gonna be sticking to something called LAMP, which is Linux, Apache, MySQL, and PHP. It's a very common yet older invocation of how you would set up a server hosting environment. So we'll discuss some other topics this semester, some of, you know, other ways of structuring information and servers. Uh, but for today, let's stick with this one so we can get a baseline. So assume these can be swapped out, right? So there's an operating system, right? Linux that can get swapped out. Apache, something to handle the server connections that can get swapped out with Nginx or any number of other things express. Uh, MySQL, which is your database layer. There's lots of different databases. It's just a popular one. PHP is your scripting language, right? That can also get swapped out. All of these applications that you'll ever experience, build, you know, pick apart, are going to have these like four aspects to them if they're beyond, you know, a demo. Obviously, a lot of demos people set up don't have, um, you know, like an actual running database or whatever. So today, let's meet our SSA or Stupid Simpsons app. So 
front end of this stupid Simpsons application is called db.php. We are getting very basic here. And all it does is connect and say, yep, I was able to connect. So what's behind that file is this scripting language. So imagine this file is sitting on the server. It's served up to you via Apache because you accessed that web address here previously, the 54. So you access that web address. The server runs this file. PHP interprets this part of it, connects to MySQL in this case, and then prints out some HTML saying, hey, I successfully connected to this database with the name DB. Database connection is great. Right, so all that information printed on the front end of the application that you would see on your phone or computer is handled in this way. These things are doing these little tiny bits of processing and then spitting out HTML ultimately that you see. That's like everything is going to deliver HTML more or less. So what we get on the other side of that application is, in this case, this silly example goes and queries a database that has lots of different character names from Simpsons and then the episodes they were in, and in this case, it prints a photo of Bart because it's just a JPEG 64 encoded image. So to get that, there's a qu database query involved. It's printed out some HTML. It's printed a table tag, which is another HTML tag, and then it's set up some rows and headers and things that you see there. So every part of this table and all the data coming from it happens right in this little 20 line block of code. So smash that submit button, uh, like and subscribe. No, it's not the end. Uh, form sends back to the back end. So in our example, we have the ability to insert new data. And so we can insert new data with this little form. We just check the box for main character, say the name is Smithers, hit submit. But what happens is that data gets sent from the front end of our application to the back end. It gets posted to, or in this case, it uses get, a little more than I said posted, but it gets sent to the back end and this insert.php script in this case. So we have other HTML tags. All form input is HTML as well. We've got a heading, we've got our form indicating when the user hits submit, send it here. Yeah, this is a request method, which is get, we'll get into today. And then some values. So I've typed in the box, I've clicked the checkbox for it's a main character, and I've typed in this box and I've written Smithers. So if you really want to get deeper down the rabbit hole of this, I mean, I'm running through at high level to be perfectly honest. Um, this is a nice infographic from PCNinja.com. There's also some other amazing Googles in here, but you know, this gets into breaking down a URL, how things get from your computer to the modem, out the door, etc. So getting into HTML, because that's the point, is just to establish a little bit about what happens with a web server and delivering HTML as we saw in all those examples. So some rules associated with HTML that you may or may not know. All lowercase in name and attribute names. What do I mean? I mean this, the name of the tag, it must be lowercase. Do you hear me react? I'm sorry, that's advanced. It must be lowercase or it's not valid HTML. Okay, sorry, gosh, I don't know where that guy comes from. So values can be anything in between the quotes. So in this case, we have a paragraph tag or is abbreviated as P and then class, which is an attribute that helps provide some styling bridge to CSS. And we say class equals, and then whatever's in the quotes is the value of that, right? So I have ID equals thing. You can also have Boolean or, you know, like kind of simple, true, false, yes, no style uh, attributes. And in this case, I have hidden. Now that could be written as like hidden equals true, or hidden equals hidden, in quotes, which is annoying, but it, those are all effectively the same evaluation. So all tags open and close like XML, if you're familiar with XML, extensible markup language. So has to have open, close, right? So I'm an HTML tag right now. I just, it's a really hideous HTML tag. It talks a lot. However, it's got the brackets on either side, so it's valid. And I'm lowercase apparently, but then it must close. So then it must have a slash, right? Right, close. And now the BTO Pro tag is closed. Sweet. Um, so there are a few minor, older examples of things that are self-closing. Self-closing tags do not need a closing tag to them. They can just close within the singular tag. 
You don't see this a ton. Image, uh, HR, uh, BR, which is short for break. HR is horizontal rule. It just draws a line. Break, which is a visual break on the page. And a handful of others are self-closed. So some of the metadata tags are closed, self-closed. So common HTML tags in the head of the document, top of the document. You must have the whole document wrapped in an HTML tag. Then we've got the head or where all of the initial setup information takes place. This is things like the title, what assets to load, um, maybe some search engine optimization sorts of things, references to other stuff. Then the body tag, which is where all the visual information takes place. So anything you see on the other side on your phone, that's coming from the body tag, right? Bracket body, everything you write there is what's gonna show up and then closing bracket body. Um, so there's script tag, which runs JavaScript, the only scripting language that's valid to write in the browser, just kind of because, which annoys a lot of people, but because of history, JavaScript is the only approved language to run in the browser. Um, style, which is we can do add inline CSS to the page. So a style tag allows you to just write CSS right there that will influence um, the different parts of the page. Title is what shows up in the URL bar. Um, meta is like metadata. It's usually used for search engines or Facebook or Twitter or social graph types of things to provide data so that, you know, if you paste in a link to this video because you really like it, there's some metadata in YouTube that's going to talk to one of your social media platforms and say, hey, here's a cool banner image to show. Uh, link is loading a remote resource. This would be like referencing a J uh, JavaScript or CSS file. JavaScript files are typically .js files and CSS is .css. So some other tags commonly see div is just a divider, just groups stuff visually. It doesn't provide any other purpose. P is semantically a paragraph. People use them all over the place. Um, it also kind of doubles as just a divider, but it is supposed to be for semantically that you are writing text that is in a paragraph form so that, you know, if you're in Microsoft Word or Google Docs or whatever, you hit enter, and it makes a new paragraph. That's supposed to be what each of those are. BR is just a visual break. I highly recommend against them as much as possible. They're very inconsistent. They're not evenly spaced. It's kind of an older concept in the web. B or strong, both imply bold text. B is the older way of doing this. Strong is the, you know, more semantically approved way. But if you wrap text in a strong tag or a B tag, it'll show up a little bit bolder, bigger font weight. I or EM is short for uh, emphasis or italics. Again, wrap it, makes it kind of sideways. Table is for tabular data, think Excel, and you've got listings and you've got heading orders, right? So that's like our bulleted list. Headings is like really large text down the document. Now, it's not supposed to just be purely visual, but a lot of people use it that way. So common HTML tags in the body. Uh, we've got A, which turns something into a hyperlink uh, to somewhere else. So you can reference another document or web page. IMG, which is displaying an image of a certain size. Time, which is the way you're supposed to show time in a document, but I don't really know too many people that do, <laughs> but that's how you're supposed to represent time. Then there's a ton of things for interfacing uh, with other systems, taking user input, things like select, radio, text area, form, buttons, labels. And then you've got pre, code, block quote, HR. There's a lot of other ones that exist. You can see some intro level uh, descriptors on w3schools.com. There's lots of other sites you can search for like, what are the valid tags? There's tons of tags that like nobody uses but exist. So semantic HTML, because um, I mentioned the word semantic a few times, would be something like the difference between these two documents. So we can see HTML versus HTML5 in this case, four being the, you remember four, like fourth revision and five being the fifth revision. So the big change there had to do with semantics. So when we talk about semantic HTML, we're talking about instead of just using things like div tags, which I mentioned, break up the page, right? So having content and then a bunch of postings and the footer and header of our document, you actually use tags that help supply that semantic meaning intentionality. This can help for uh, screen readers, SEO or search engine optimization, but also just basically like 
developers as well go, oh, that's a header, it's a navigation area. I should only have one header. I should have a main area. I shouldn't have a whole ton of main tags, right? So it's the intention of this in the document. Then you can read more about it uh, in, in this article I have linked to Viking Code School. Um, so within that structure, you have other tags, right? So here I have the main, it has an article, and then in the article, there's another header and a time element. Hey, there's a time. And then other things, right? Like divs, headings, paragraphs, whatever. So this makes up our DOM or document object model. So what is that? Well, a web page structure and nesting is DOM, right? So what you're being delivered is a hierarchical document and that is commonly known as the DOM. So variations of DOM exist. We might cover them in some future topics. There's uh, there's a thing called virtual DOM, which is like something not yet added to the document. It typic, it's a JavaScript connotation. It's effectively you're manipulating something that's on the page, but you're doing it kind of off to the side, making a lot of changes, and then putting it in the real document object model for people to see. Shadow DOM, if you've ever seen that, is a kind of hidden document or another context within the DOM. Now that's certainly gonna be confusing if you're new to what the DOM is, but effectively you can have certain HTML elements in the page that kind of hide away what makes up that, that HTML. It's still HTML, but it's hidden away so that CSS doesn't cascade um, in the same way. It's, very, it's a very complex subject. Uh, if you look up anything around web components, you'll definitely see a lot of talk of Shadow DOM, we'll cover it in future lectures. And then light DOM, which is effectively another way of saying like the normal DOM. You really only see people talk about light DOM in the context of virtual DOM sometimes and shadow DOM more frequently. Light DOM is just what is visible to you and is actually a tag sitting there. So these DOM varieties come up in JavaScript application development for sure. So let's follow the DOM if I were to inspect a document. Right, we've got our HTML tag, which makes up the whole document. Then we're tracing down, we've got our header tag, or head tag in this case, which provides all the headers set up for our document. All right, so we've got title, this is what we'd see at the top, some styles, and then the body tag. And the body tag is then gonna present a heading and a paragraph and another heading to us, right? And the DOM is this hierarchy that this makes up. So I'm sure something, false scene, this, website. This website is a website made out of HTML, just like the rest of them. So right click on any web page, and we'll just do it on this one, and you can inspect and start to pick apart what the different parts of this document object model are. You can find it under elements. And so you right click, inspect document, you get this developer tab that pops out, and we can start tracing through the document object model. So we can see that everything on the page is able to be backtraced to, in this case, an IMG tag. It links to an actual image. It's rendered there. And then there's some CSS that actually makes the image look a certain way, provides a margin to it, things like that. So there's, there's a direct correlation. Anything that you see on the page, you should be able to right click and kind of figure out how it got there. Um, it's a very unique aspect of developing with HTML. It's part of why I love the web is you can learn from other people's just websites they send you every day. So in these tabs, we've got it broken out into here's your HTML DOM structure. At the top, you can click and navigate through and it'll highlight on the other side and your CSS styling. So we're looking at that image in the document. So CSS, because I mentioned it, we haven't men talked about what it is at all. So it's cascading, which is the operative word, style sheets. So it's cascading styles. Cascading meaning it waterfalls through HTML tags and selectors, applying to things below it. So if I have a paragraph tag and I say, hey, all the paragraphs get you know, this larger font, cascades down, oh, I found a paragraph, and there's the thing. But if you have like a paragraph that has a bulleted list in it, so like a P space UL, it will cascade and everywhere that it hits a paragraph, I'll start looking for a UL and go, oh, I found a UL that's in a P, in a paragraph tag. So these styles provide visual treatment, right? You can do font, uh, you know, there's a whole box model to it associated with spacing, padding, font size, 
color, background color, animation, all kinds of things. And then Sheets, um, which is a running document of text that brings in the styles. So common CSS syntax, all selectors, as they're called, like the thing that you're trying to target to apply the styles, must be wrapped in brackets. All attributes can be on the same line or multiple, but must end in a semicolon. Style sheets can reference and pull in other style sheets. So you can chain selectors to cascade or do multiple selectors. I'll show a bunch of examples of these. And there's hundred, literally hundreds of attributes possible, but they're commonly things like color, text alignment, uh, is this being displayed, margin, padding, uh, border. If you want to influence it, you probably can. You know, just Google the thing. So here's a, a, a little example. So dot selects items by class. Meaning in, in the HTML, we have a paragraph tag class equals whatever that I can select it by a dot whatever in CSS. So in CSS to apply styles to that, I would write dot whatever and then brackets and the color. I'm saying, hey, the color is blue, which would then select this because it has a class of whatever and it would make the text blue. Then I could do an ID selector is another comma one is a pound sign. The pound sign targets if it says, you know, P tag or div or anything else, uh, ID equals thing. I'm going to be able to target that thing and apply in this case, font size 16. It's going to have a top border that is 10 pixels wide, solid black. So you can also nest these selectors, right? So reading this would be a UL tag or unordered list and then give me a list item underneath there. In this case, a unordered list, then the list item in there that has an unordered list in it that also has a list item. So that'd be like a thing nested in a thing nested in a thing. Uh, section div.row image. Uh, so give me all the images in a div that has the class row that is inside of a section tag, right? So we can stack and chain these things together uh, indefinitely. <clears throat> And you can select on attributes. So it doesn't have to, you know, there's kind of first party advantage, if you will, um, or built in advantage for uh, the dot selector for classes and the pound sign for IDs, but you can select on any other attribute you want. So you could have made up attributes, more or less. You could have div data hyphen fun equals something, and then you could target that in CSS and say div, you do this other, different bracket instead of the curly bracket, data hyphen fun, so this is your attribute, equals something in this case. You can also do state. So state selectors would be like if this is checked, if it's empty, enabled, hovered, like the mouse hovers over the thing. Focus would be potentially hovered, but it would also be like tabbing to tab through uh, items and disabled if something is enabled or disabled, particularly in like form inputs. You know, if you have a submit button that's disabled, that's a state of that button. Some less common CSS syntax that's also totally valid is pseudo selectors. So this usually is where people get into the fancy stuff um, as far as like really complex animations and things. But so you can say colon colon before, <clears throat> and this is going to give you the fictional space before whatever the item is. And then in that fictional space, you can just do kind of whatever you want there. A lot, you know, you might see someone draw like a circle there. Um, or after, the fictional space after. Um, you can do other selectors like first letter, first child, which would be the first thing underneath something, first line, which gets really wonky. That'd be like, maybe I'm writing some text and I want the first line of text visually on the screen to be like way taller than the next or something like that. Um, slotted is a pseudo selector um, related to Shadow DOM and web components we'll get into later on, uh, but that lets you pick one thing beneath it, in part, which allows you to target a sp very specific type of attribute that is in something shadow root. Don't even know that we'll get into that in web components. It's it's pretty bleeding edge, honestly. People haven't really, it hasn't had a ton of uptick yet, but it's very, very powerful, very complicated. So pseudo selectors for not as well. So I could say, hey, in this case, and this is an example from YouTube, this is saying on the HTML, the whole document, if we do not have the class style.scoped. Now, if we don't have style scope, apply these and this, this hyphen hyphen, and then uh, whatever you feel like, 
This is a CSS variable. So you can actually store values as these variables and then repurpose them across your CSS. So what you're looking at here is this would be effectively saying, if the HTML document we loaded does not support shadow DOM, because I know that's it leaves these style scope tags all over the place. So if our document doesn't support shadow DOM, it's an older browser, set the CSS variables to be like this. So some PSU examples cascading on that logo. We can see dot brand, so that means class brand, dot header logo, right? So dot brand, dot header logo image, implying, hey, uh, I'm going to target an image that is inside of something that has a class of header hyphen logo. We can see that here, image, and then there's a link that has class header hyphen logo. And that is inside of a brand, so inside the brand class. So this gets targeted because the selector is dot brand, dot header hyphen logo in IMG tag. Also note that the IMG tag itself matches two other places, right? So it combines all these together and the most specific selector wins. So this is with 100, if there was a generic image selector that said with 50%, this is a more specific selector. And so you would get the width 100. So WTF is margin, because there was a margin set there. <clears throat> I mentioned it before. So this gets into part of DOM known as the box model. It's very important when it comes to how things are spaced out, how these are calculated mathematically, how things float next to each other, stuff like that. So the DOM follows what's known as a box model. This means every element forms a box. Divs, you know, take up the whole area, right? It's just a divider. And then you style them and maybe you'd say, oh, it's 50% and it's got a margin, which is this fictional space in front of it, or it's got padding. It's the fictional space inside of it. So it expands. So you end up with a visual like this. You can actually get this picture uh, inside of the inspector as you're going through and you inspect the document. So margin is the space beyond the box. Border is the space at the end of the box. So it's like a line typically. Padding is the space inside the box and height and width are just the item itself. So using these concepts, right, we get into sizing because sizing is important when it comes to CSS. There's different ways to apply sizing. So you can use different units. You can use, you know, percentages, pixels, M's, REMs, if you've ever seen them, um, and things like VW and VH. So unpacking what all of these are, and they're not really best to be mixed together. So people usually kind of pick one methodology and stick with it for whatever their design it could just be a little card or whatever, um, versus the whole document, they might use different ones. But so percent is percentage available. So if I have an image that's inside of a div, and that div says, hey, you are 100 pixels wide, and then the image says, hey, you're 50 percent wide, that would be 50 pixels because it's inside of a contained box as the boxes all stack and enclose each other. Uh, so pixels, number of pixels, but that can get really confusing because we have monstrous <laughs> resolution monitors now, uh, but people still largely do use pixels a lot of times. Then we've got VW, which is certainly less common. But I, I really like using it for things like modals <clears throat> and pop-ups, um, is viewable width. So 20 VW would mean 20% of the viewable width, like of your screen itself would be taken up by whatever it is. And then there's viewable height, which is the same thing, but just for height, how tall is the device? Uh, then you've got EM, which is the size relative to the font size of its parent. So if something sets the font size and then the children have like a 0.5 EM, whatever the font size of the parent item, you multiply by that EM value and you'll get the child. So if the parent has 16 pixels and the child is 0.5 EM, then you've got eight pixels effectively. So it allows you to kind of mix and match these units together <clears throat> um, and do things relative to other things. It's really good for scaling uh, mobile design, things like that. Then REMS is the size relative to the font size of the document. So very confused. There's a really good article in CSS Tricks about the difference between these. <laughs> um, but, um, and especially when people start mixing them, they accidentally use one instead of the other. So REM would be the whole document says, hey, text is 20 pixels high. 
usually you end up having a pixel value at some point. You kind of have to have a, a, def, a, a baseline to work off of. So you say, hey, document, you are 20 pixels. Then maybe you have a heading tag and you say the heading is two rems. H1 is two rems um, font size. That would imply that it's two times the font size of the overall document. And so you can scale things in, uh, in proportionality, which is why a lot of designers like both of these values for different reasons. So again, there's an article you can read a lot more about that. So class names, ID names, classes can be named anything, but should be semantic, right? So I probably should have something like card, right? So, hey, this is a div, but on the page, I'm going to visualize it as a card of information. So I'm going to call the class card. It's not just going to be called a like class W. Then special card might be something like a variation on card. Okay, I've got a card, but this one's yellow. So I'm going to name it something like card hyphen hyphen yellow to imply it's the yellow card. Now there's nothing, it's, again, this is a naming convention. You can make it whatever you want. Um, but the CSS selector for that would be dot card hyphen hyphen yellow. And then I apply whatever. It also then would look nice visually as I'm, you know, the developer reading the code, right? I've got card and then I probably have card hyphen hyphen hyphen, hyphen yellow. So like the variation of that. Now, maybe we have a button in a special card. So in this case, we've got card hyphen hyphen yellow and then button, which is then card. And in this case, it has double underscores and the word button. So again, these are just like conventional things, but <clears throat> the reason I might do that is, okay, so I've got a yellow card, which I can read and say is a variation of a card. And I personally look at the double hyphens and go, yeah, that's a variation. Now the underscores would imply this is a button, but it's a button that's used inside of a card. So it's not, it's not part of card. It's just something we use in card or could use in card. So we've got our designed card and then we've got a designed button. So naming these things semantically and starting from the beginning doing that will make your life way easier. Now, IDs on the other hand, identifiers, the ID equals whatever, must be unique per document. It's an accessibility thing. So largely you don't wanna be targeting IDs very often unless you really know why you're making an ID in the first place. So the method I showed above is actually called BAM. So this is an, a basic example of BAM. I can't possibly do BAM. Justice. Um, it is a CSS naming convention to try and make your life sane when it comes to organizing large documents, right? If we're just making like a card or a button, that's fine. But any modern web page is not going to have one card or one button. It's going to have hundreds. So you need a way of sifting through the chaos when you are developing and having to edit and modify these different pieces. Again, back to CSS tricks. They got a great article on BAM, BAM 101. Highly recommend. Another another concept in CSS is called media queries. And so the at media is a very special CSS wrapper or selector, whatever you want to call it, um, that can get the context of the device or the media presenting device that is currently rendering this website. So in this example here, we are saying at media, which implies a media query, when the media device is rendering this, if it's between 500 pixels and 600 pixels wide, so I'm on a phone, right? This area of the phone, okay, it's wide. I'm holding it this way versus this way, right? Because that would change the media query. If I turn my phone sideways, I'm going to get a different screen real estate potentially. So maybe I'm tipped like this, and then we pick a value that more or less implies this is probably like an older iPhone or something like that. Well, then I want the headings to be uh, fuchsia. And I want a descriptive text, right? You can write whatever CSS you want. It's just what it is. But this CSS only applies when the media viewing it matches. So another area, there's certainly for uh, further exploration. And I found this tool to be extremely helpful in helping me understand how to uh, implement it is CSS grid. So CSS grid is a way of, instead of writing tons of different classes and saying like, this is area one, two, three, four, five, you can actually do what's called a grid. So we see over here, it says display grid, and it's going to help you lay out your material in this way so that you could actually just say like, this area goes in grid and give it a name, but do it at the CSS selector level as opposed to having a whole ton of complex content uh, down below. So it's a really powerful way of, of building out and laying out material. I found this grid.layoutit 
com website to be fantastic. Um, it lets you build, like click and build the grid and it gives you a little example code pen. It shows you exactly what CSS to write. It's a really good way of picking it apart and reverse engineering. So another area where I always just go to an article uh, when I get stuck is Flexbox. Flexbox is a concept within CSS, in which you can say display flex. So the default display for something like a div is display block. And the default display for a span tag, which I didn't even mention, but it's just a little visual, like there's something spanning here. So it's just a visual inline uh, block area. Well, you can do things that are called flex. And so you need a really long article to explain it. CSS Tricks does an amazing job with this. But it's effectively, I have a container element, and then maybe I have three divs in it. I want to tell them, hey, you guys should just sit next to each other. I don't want to say, hey, you you are 33% wide, and you're 40% wide, and you're the difference wide. So what Flex does, it allows you to have the content kind of be squishy and sit in line with each other. There's different modifiers, so you can modify the order so that maybe rendered, they go one, two, three, four, five, but then presented, it goes like five, four, two, one, three, things like that. Another really good... Uh, article stepping through how to implement that with examples. And because of this, because of the complexities of CSS and how do I structure this? How do we name things? We end up getting design libraries and frameworks. So these are just a couple of them, but effectively, like everybody's made a card, right? So like once you get a card and you get good at CSS or half decent, you don't find a lot of satisfaction in making cards anymore. <laughs> or fill in the blank, anything else. It could be a button, it could be a link, <clears throat> uh, it could be a listing of items, whatever it is. Once you've made it a couple dozen times, you don't really want to anymore. And no one else does either. And so they've collaborated on these different design libraries. Um, things like Tailwind, Zurb Foundation, Bootstrap, Material, uh, Material UI, stuff like that. So um, what happens though, as I would say from being in, industry for a little bit longer than that that part of adopting these is then you go huh i literally have to use this for everything else in the rest of the project and so certainly get to there with web components as to why that is a limiting factor but um some examples from this space um so if you go to getbootstrap.com bootstrap says hey do you want something that on a normal device lays out as three columns well instead of figuring out all that flex Flexbox stuff. I just want you to make a div and give it a class is column hyphen four, which would imply that this is a four, four columns of space, right? They're basically chunking the UI into columns. So you define instead of pixel length or display width, you're effectively defining columns. So there's like fictional columns there and then how they get filled out. So I could do like call hyphen eight, and I would know that it's going to be a certain amount wide relative to everything else in the document. If I had an eight next to a four and it's inside of a 12, now I've got a complete row. If I've got an eight next to a five inside of a 12, now it bumps down. Things like that that then you don't need to figure out because they're just kind of mathematically calculated. They have very semantic names to things. <clears throat> Tailwind is very uh, popular recently. And Tailwind takes this to the next level, in my opinion. Um, so it uses class names that are very semantic, but for all kinds of little tiny fine grain pieces of functionality, so you can keep them uniform across. So for example, text hyphen LG, making sure that that is the same every time, or making sure that you say, ah, yeah, I want something that's semi-bold. Not that you maybe have a CSS class called like our comp dot our company card, and then you happen to say font weight bold or font weight 300, which would be a 300 density. So that you're very verbosely saying, right, this I, this image is 32 units wide and 32 units high, stuff like that. Uh, round it, right? So round it makes it into a circle, right? So Tailwind is very hot right now. <laughs> um, so I highly recommend checking that out. They have a really good playground website as far as like getting deep into um, deep into the project and understanding the semantics of it by just like clicking a button and having a sandbox really well done project documentation wise. So um, because of all of these projects and building out these these uh, libraries um, for design, 
we end up getting CSS abstractions. So ways people write code that then are interpreted to generate CSS uh, because of how verbose it, it would have to be for something like that Tailwind example. Um, lots of little teeny tiny parts of design aspect. So again, people get good at CSS, then they get bored, then they adopt SAS, then they become developers, then they hate CSS, and then they're stuck with SAS. It's kind of the same feedback loop as the libraries thing as far as a goofy critique. But you can learn more about SAS at sasslang.com. I personally do not like things that interpret and compile other you know, web languages. I like to be able to know what it is. But say that you have uh, a color chart and you need to quickly print out like 256 possible colors um, as far as CSS variables, that's a programming problem. You shouldn't have to be sitting there manually typing every variable name. So SAS is really good for that type of stuff. So, um, you know, I hate SAS because it's an abstraction, as I just mentioned, and it requires a lot of tooling. But then I wrote a really complex tooling project in order to organize and manage my web component portfolio. So I don't exactly have consistency. Um, <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, HTML standards. So the HTML uh, takes structured data and interactions and visualizes it for us. It has a standard that's been built over the decades, uh, really starting in 1993. So the only styling and design it has are very basic browser defaults. Browser vendors interpret standards and render them for you. And support for all the super old bad annoying stuff kind of has to come along because I don't deprecate those things with the exception of maybe like the blink tag. So uh, this is a funny Easter egg. If you go to Google and you just type the word blink tag, um, there was a tag called blink that just made text blink. And if you are old enough to remember any websites from the 90s, they abuse this as like trying to get your attention. It's flashy. Hey, look at this blinking text. That's not an, an accessibility issue. So there are websites that will still interpret this tag and run it. Um, it's it's deprecated. You are not supposed to use the blink tag for many, many reasons. So are there differences between the browsers as far as implementations? Sadly, yes. So we're getting a lot better, particularly the last three years. Um, I've noticed the W3C was founded to help implement and create web standards in a uniform manner. It was very academic. At first, you can look up the history of W3C. In 2004, all these companies that were starting to emerge and make products that only exist because of the web wanted to push the web further than it was at that moment. So this formed the Web Hypertext Application Technology Working Group, a mouthful, uh, <laughs> founded by browser vendors to push HTML further than W3C was able to at that time. So this was very focused on getting HTML5 out the door. HTML5 uh, has a lot of more advanced features, things like video, audio, stuff that previously you would need Flash or um, ActiveX or lots of different plugins um, or QuickTime video, stuff like that. HTML5 basically brought about the end of those things. And excitingly, in 2019, these two organizations effectively have merged their have merged their efforts to say we're working on the same thing here. The future of the web and the future of you know application development for it are very important and, and need to be intertwined. So very high level, how a browser workflow or how the browser processes the page and gets it to you. Um, so this is Mozilla Gecko from HTML5 Rocks. It's an older document, but it's the same general idea, right? So HTML parses a document. It reads through the DOM. It reads off the style rules to say, hey, I've got some style sheets. It combines them together, paints it for you, and then you see it on your display. And the different browsers work slightly differently, right? So in this case, the HTML and CSS uh, documents are handled independently and then attached together and then rendered, painted, and display. Things are laid out at the time they're being rendered, and then it's painted Right, so there's some slight timing differences, but they are different engines powering these things. So the what I would is a community. It is a community that has been maintaining and evolving HTML since 2004. This is how we got HTML5, and it's copyright Apple, Google, Mozilla, and Microsoft, which is the community or a consortium by another name. So. This is not like my view. I have been presented this, this worldview before, but an oligopoly is also a series of industry partners, not a lot of them, 
that have a direct reason for something to move forward in a uniform manner. So there's barriers to entry in an oligopoly and not a lot of product differentiation and possibility of collusion. Like outside of open source, when mega companies work together to build something to sell products, we would call that collusion. And in open source and in web standards, we just call it a standards body and they're all working together. So it's a consortium largely of corporations. I just like this picture again. Um, and so the only reason that I, I mention this is it's a little disingenuous at times, in my opinion, to say the web is built as a community. Yeah, you're right. Anyone can contribute. Anyone with enough time. Anyone with enough resources. Anyone who is free from enough work responsibilities. Yes, they can contribute to and build and shape the future of the web. And so, yes, Microsoft, Google, uh, Apple, yeah, they want to pay people to have free time to influence these standards that are available for anyone to modify um, for everyone's benefit. So I only say this because yes, these things are an open community. That's, it's a really good thing. It's a positive for all of us that we have, you know, these different browser vendors working on a singular standard so that we can get things delivered to us on our devices. But it's, an awful close at times, especially given that like Edge and Google are working collectively on Chromium and Chromium powers like 70% of all web traffic. It's a little, a little dicey. Not now, but I think eventually it might. So uh, caniuse.com is a great list of what works in each browser at a very low level in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. It's updated regularly, shows you the support tables for all kinds of things across these different uh, platforms. It even has some some less common uh, items mentioned there, right? So we have like QQ browser, Beidou, uh, Samsung internet, things that you might not immediately think of with like the big five as far as like uh, Edge, Firefox, Chrome, Safari, Opera is still in that group. So can I use and see so you could type in div and go, yes, everything supports a div. Now, I think it's hilarious that like IE 6 through 10 did not support divs, but um or a dialogue element, right? So dialogue is a much newer element. It's not supported in Firefox and Safari. And so you can use this to go, hey, there's a dialogue tag. Oh, well, the dialogue tag works in these three browsers, but not the others. So maybe I shouldn't use it. You go search for CSS, right? I can search for CSS grid. <clears throat> and I can see that even back to IE 11, uh, which is a big breaking point, this IE 11 versus Edge, if you're not aware, um, like IE 11 is... is Thank goodness people largely are not supporting it anymore. But for a while, you had to pretty much look at charts like this to figure out if you could use a technology based on if it was going to have a way to work in IE 11. So you can also put in advanced JavaScript concepts. So here I've got intersection observer. This is implying like the visible area on the page as I scroll by or something, uh, that that div is visible, right? So you can really get in the weeds as far as what can I use can give you back. Even things like Wasm, which we won't get into, is just web assembly, which you can see is pretty awesome and supported a lot of places. Um, so this is a great list of what works in each browser at a very low level. HTML, CSS, JavaScript, updated regularly. It's a great place to figure out what doesn't support Apple's business model and thus ensures that it not be added to Safari or any iOS browser. And so we get into our blue screen of death, cracked fragmented reality moment. But why care about web standards when there's an app for that? Web standards is just a thing. It's a bunch of uh, companies agreeing upon the way at which all of us consume and access information and the APIs that we have available to us in order to do that. But why does that matter? I mean, I've got an app. I go and tap it on it from the app store, whatever. So um, this is a semi-rant uh, dovetailing something Alex Russell, who's slightly late on Twitter. He's he works on, on Google Chrome, so that also should influence some opinions potentially as far as what worldview is. But um, there's some mean, you know, meme war here. There's some company battle, right? There's some like, hey, this you know, you know just Safari or this is just Chrome. These are two companies backed by Google or, or not companies, products backed by Google and Apple, right? So maybe this is just some jockeying here. However, 
out on the open web, I'm not going to have, you know, my Smurf Berries game where a child racks up $1,400 in charges because of access to APIs in the browser necessarily, right? So the App Store insulates that aspect of the internet and people's accessing of information from the larger what's possible and gives access to deeper APIs on the device automatically. And there are antitrust litigations that are pending associated with this. Um, and Google has them too. I'm not like some Google uh, shill. So there are reasons why standards and these groups working together is really important. It keeps them honest. Yes, I mentioned oligopoly and that's to kind of be trolly, but this is really important that these groups work out in the open and leverage open standards for building the web so we don't get these little silos everywhere that are known as apps that could easily run as web apps in the browser that I can poke and pick apart and get access to their source or whatever. So Apple makes $64 billion off the App Store. And so a lot of what Alex is ransom that that thread and other things are is that they do not have a market incentive to make it easier to download apps or access web apps via phone. Things like uh, progressive web apps, which is an actual term, PWA. Uh, you could actually download an app, click the button, have it show up on your phone. Apple lagged way behind everybody else as far as support for things like service workers and other low level APIs. And Alex is kind of calling them out saying, you do it because you've got so you're just printing bank off of this. So again, maybe this is just like mega corporations arguing about something. However, everybody's not cleaning this. There's some interesting questions associated with like people switching from Chrome to Edge and the fact that Edge is built off of what Chrome's built off of. So Microsoft and Google are working on one browser. So you know, uh, again, though, there is merit to ranting about the fact that uh, Apple is not in step with the rest of the industry. And yes, Google and Microsoft are, you know, working on this one thing together. Maybe that's problematic or could be construed that way. I don't think it's problematic, but I could see how someone could see it that way. However, if you go to try and run Chrome or Edge, on uh, an iOS device, you're not actually running Chrome or Edge because they require that the only browser running on that device is Safari based. So even Firefox, which is a completely open, uh, open built browser, um, it also has to use Safari's engine. Safari's APIs must be the only thing on the web running on an iOS device, which is a little bizarre. So as Alex puts it, if you're a web developer, that means that iOS, the whole OS, is the new IE6. Your CEO and the wealthiest users won't switch off of it, so it taxes everything you do. They also can't imagine the web being great because for them, it isn't, right? If they don't invest in the web platform and in st open standards in allowing everybody to have access to every new web technology, not just their engine that they specifically control and can ensure is not in conflict with the app store's engine, they have no reason to change. There's no reason to invest in the browser in the same way because it's, well, we've already invested in this other thing that everybody's already using and printing $64 billion. So I know it's a little funny, the web surveillance capitalism, which is certainly the Google model, calling out the monopolistic app store structure I mean, only in the Valley do we have multi-billion dollar organizations arguing over API usage. But now back to HTML. So it's time for the web lab. Now, I'm not gonna grade the web lab because I'm not grading you, YouTube. This is where normal class and lab time and access to university resources come into play. However, in case you're interested in what the web lab is, the deliverable for lab two. You internal monologue, a good game. But can you code it? Make a resume using HTML and CSS. Make sure it uses he headings for relevant areas. Make sure it uses bulleted lists and list items for your skills that you have, or at least that you tell yourself you do. Do not, under any circumstances, use tables 
for a layout. This makes accessibility puppies cry, okay? No tables for laying this information out. Select one of the following options for submission this week. So, as with every week, there are multiple ways to do any of the labs. So pick the one that speaks the best to you. If you're an IST or you're a developer and you really want to take that to the next step, then do that. If you're just here to learn a little bit about IT, pick up some code stuff around, along the way, understand the lexicon, maybe pick some of the easier options, right? It's up to you. I try to mix this up so that it's more tailored to what you want to do in the world. It's not just here, this is what you do, because the web is insanely bad. So for option one, fork one of the following code pens and fill them out with your details. Each of these are a different type of resume. Um, just to reverse engineer, pick at the HTML, get a better understanding of how these things work. So when you do a video about this and you write your blog post up about you know, your resume that you make, your video should be involving explaining CSS, how it cascades, visually demonstrating how like things like color and padding and changing attributes and class names manipulate each other. I want to see that you understand the relationship between HTML, modifying the HTML, and visually in modifying the CSS, having the two work together to, to run things and, and change visually. Code pens are a great place to do this. You can easily fork these code pens as a starting point. Option two, I want you to do more research on CSS grid. It's almost as if your instructor doesn't know anything about it. I don't. So use grid.layoutit.com if you need to, or just, you know, Google around like we all do in web professional land to help build a boilerplate for your resume. And then make a basic resume using this grid as a template. Your video should be explaining CSS grid to the best of your abilities, as well as how the tools work and save a lot of time and effort. It is a really powerful tool set. I just don't have the answers there, but other people do. So seek them out. Option three, fork one of the following code pens and fill in your details for your resume. Um, so these ones use SAS and Stylus. So I didn't even mention Stylus. So if you want to get into the weeds a bit about compiled CSS um, or pre-processed CSS, I'm not a big fan of SAS, as I mentioned, but it is you know still popular in a lot of industries. So it's worth at least being aware of. Um, it does speak to some people, particularly those that are more design system minded. I, that's just not where my head is, so I'm not a big fan. So your video should show you using code, pen, code pen to reflect changes on the resume, just like option one was, except you know explaining how the CSS variables uh, work to achieve this. Option four, oh my gosh, there's four options. So use Tailwind CSS, because it's so hot right now, to create a basic resume from scratch or a boilerplate. I mean, you can Google and find boilerplates. Um, and then post your site to the web, either using GitHub or CodePen. Yeah, I mean, I know if you're posting it to GitHub or you're getting it out on a website uh, or web service, yes, that doesn't involve tooling. Have fun figuring all that out because that's, go do it. Um, so using play.tailwindcss.com as your starting point. It's a really great space to learn more about Tailwind CSS and understand how you would build a resume or a basic you know, website using it. So create a hello world video about getting started with Tailwind CSS so that someone else, particularly me, could learn how to make a resume using that technology. Assume I know nothing. It's just what I've Googled before you've Googled it. I'm just kidding. So uh, lab two submissions, create your resume and then put a link to your video using an A tag. So you have to use HTML on the top of your resume. Uh, submit new posts into the lab two HTML basics channel in our Slack working channel. And it's due as always by Sunday EST at midnight. So the rubric for this, my rubrics all follow a very similar formula. Did you do it? Did you try to do it? Did you attempt to explain it? Even if you failed and like messed up and have a story about how you went through and the iterative process of failing and learning, I'm trying to seek out that you learned something. I don't, I'm not going, ooh, <laughs> look at, hey, get, look at this over here. This idiot used a padding left. <laughs> I said he used padding. <laughs> no, I don't care about, that's, that's not the point. This is experimentation. This is learning by experiencing and growing through it, okay? That's what we've all done in the web development profession. It's, it's just an explorative process. You have to just mess with things. So, if you show that you're making progress and uncomprehension, that's what I really care about. 
and pick the option that you like and I'll you know grade accordingly. So if you say that I'm doing the tailwind option and then you don't, then you didn't do the tailwind option. And final notes, challenge yourself, please. If you've, if you've had experience with HTML and CSS, pick one of these later options. Um, build on top of what you already know. Uh, education is about helping you find your best self. I am just a guide along the way. Um, so for the lab, uh, I'll walk through the code pen, other options we have available, and then it's open lab time for just questions, live demos, things like that. So towards the end of this, you know, this gets a little bit into the logistics of what happens in my classroom, but I hope that you all enjoyed this. So in the next one, we'll get into a primer on JavaScript and front end uh, development work. So it is a primer. It is mostly a unpacking the terms, understanding more about our sphere, what these things all mean, uh, how they plug together, a little bit of the history over time. So the better you know HTML and CSS, the easier it can make it to write JavaScript, unless you talk to a JavaScript engineer and they would tell you CSS is not required because we'll just shove it into JavaScript and HTML is this legacy thing and we'll just do it ourselves. All right, trolling aside, uh, friends don't let friends use Facebook's React. Again, I troll. God, I like trolled the troll. It's in the slide to do. I had to I have to add that in. Anyway, if you have any questions or you want to see more about uh, this course, what other open topics there are, you can go to this web address, or you can hit me up on my YouTube channel, or on the Twitter webs, or wherever. So I hope this topic was interesting to you. I hope you learned a little bit about HTML and CSS, and I hope you learn more in the future with these videos. So. Go be your best you.